you think there's a higher percentage of neurodiversity, ADHD, within the sex work industry? Yeah, yeah, definitely. The raw truth about orgasms, from sex expert and OnlyFans star Alice Lovegood. I make about 60 grand a month. 60 grand a month? Yeah. That's quite a lot. That is quite a lot, isn't it? BDSM, kink and tantric sex. Riding crop, because it's like very feminine, I like it. Okay. If you want to know how to stay focused during sex, then keep on watching. So, watch me go red with embarrassment for an entire hour as we delve deeper into the world of sexual gratification from an ADHD perspective. Sorry, Mum. Alice, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I don't know why I was a bit nervous about today, because I know my, my uh, parents listen to the podcast. <laughs> so I will, um, I think I'll just ask everything as, as if I'm asking for a mate. Yeah. Being a sex educator. Mm-hmm. I'm fascinated to know how that started. Um, so it started, so originally I started um, OnlyFans just as a bit of an extra money. Mm. I used to be a midwife. Well, I studied as a midwife. Um, and I love to uh, give people information about their bodies so that they can make the best decisions that are right for them. I love making people feel comfortable and um knowledgeable and so I started OnlyFans just as an extra thing I loved it and then I realized that lots and lots of people were coming there especially men because they had questions and they wanted answers and so I thought hmm this is needed so then I did my qualification as a sex educator and that's that's how it started what when you saw those men come to come to you what, what was their sort of main questions so lots of them just wanted a space to talk about like their desires and their kinks that they liked and felt kind of weird. And they, I think a lot of them were just looking for acceptance and someone to listen to them. And then others, you know, they might be like, oh, I can't get hard on, uh, stay hard. Or I, I can't, I don't know how to help my partner have an orgasm or you know I'm a virgin and I'm really scared to lose my virginity um you know I'm 28 and I've got all this pressure to lose my virginity and I don't know what it's all about and I, I don't know what normal sex is or you know I can't I, I come really fast and I, so, so just anything um mm. and I think when someone starts listening like it's like anything in life we we think that because it's natural we should just know how to do it but you know, running is natural, walking is natural, talking is natural, but you still learn. You still have somebody to kind of guide you. And that's what we don't get with sex. So, mm. Do you think it's like a lot of young people or anyone is, is like unhealthily influenced by porn? Yeah, 100%. 100%. So I think um, porn is kind of the only place I know that I went to porn because I wanted to see what sex looked like you know diagramming as in a book isn't what real sex is so I wanted to see real sex but porn also isn't real sex so that's kind of what I like to provide when I do make content is I'll include like if he can't orgasm at the end and I've had so many people like oh my god that's normal like I thought you did every time or I include someone having a condom on you never see that in sex or, you know, the aftercare or the cuddles or the stops or the can I have a drink? All of the normal stuff in sex that you don't get shown in porn, I like to put in porn, <laughs> essentially, because that's what people think it is. Or or they think that like a woman will have an orgasm when you touch her toe because oh, <laughs> like, no, I need to work for that. Or they think that men have massive knobs that stay hard for hours. Like, you know, it's not real. That's like unrealistic expectations. Especially when you watch like, I don't know, there's one particular show on Netflix where the guy and the girl get together. Five seconds later, the woman's having an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> and you just look at it you think that's pretty so much unrealistic yeah I mean, maybe that does happen sometimes but it's mm. putting a lot of like unrealistic expectations on, on men and women stuff yeah like both because then like we've got men that can't understand how to give a woman an orgasm and women that are faking them to make them the their partner feel good and you've got this huge like gap orgasm gap of mm. I think it's only like 
20, I think it's like 20% or maybe even less than that of women orgasming from uh, like male, cis male, female, hetero uh, sex a lot of the time. And also like they they think that you can have an orgasm just from penetrative sex, but that's super, super low as well. That's like, I think only 20% of women can have sex, uh, can have an orgasm just from penetrative sex. They have, they have to have some kind of external stimulation and that's not shown on porn most of the time either. So mm. we're doing ourselves a disservice. I guess, do you think there's just so many like bits that have to be in place for the woman or the guy to feel comfortable and focused enough to achieve that orgasm? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think we have, there's a lot. So essentially in, uh, we have like a, a break and an accelerator in regards to like sexual arousal. Um, and obviously we need to reach a certain point to be able to have an orgasm. So you have, especially with ADHD, which we're talking, you have a lot of things hitting the break because you're distracted or you're thinking about something that's not sexy or, and then that's going to stop you from being able to get to that point. Hmm. I mean, I, it's, it's one of the biggest questions I had when I said I was speaking to you today was how can I sort of quieten the mind, mm -hmm. keep focus, stay in the zone. And because the main problem is that, People with ADHD, when they're getting down to business, they they lose focus or they start thinking about something unrelated. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, then they really struggle to to reach the orgasm. Mm -hmm. So I suppose, do you have any tips for people who might have ADHD and who are getting down to it and they just lose focus and they start thinking about something completely unrelated? Yeah, 100%. I definitely have had this happen to me. I Like the most awkward things would pop into my mind. Like I think once I was having sex and I suddenly was, was like, oh, I think I left the oven on. Like you, and that's just that the moment killed done. Um, so I completely can sympathize with people who have this, this problem. But mm. I think for me, there's, there's two different routes and it depends on your, your interests, but op obviously open communication and honesty within the relationship so that, you can address it. I think sometimes people with ADHD carry a lot of shame over this thing like, and feel like perhaps if they talk about it, then their partner will feel like they're not entertaining them enough or, you know, the sex isn't good. Or So being open about that being an issue, first of all. Um, and then for me, the two things that have really worked is, so BDSM and kink is one route that have, I've gone down that has helped me a lot. And then kind of like the other side is like tantric sex. So tantric sex is um, very spiritual. It's like all about like breathing into your body. So it's almost like a mindful connection and like a spiritual connection. So you're very almost like yoga combined with sex. And then BDSM and kink, it provides like physical stimulation. So you might be um, using pain, you might be using... Uh, you might be using a blindfold or uh, some kind of sensory deprivation. You might be being tied up so you can't move. Um, you could be role playing. You could be, and it just provides that like extra level of stimulation to the mind that allows you to channel your focus a lot more. That's so interesting. So it's kind of like just putting in more stimuli. Mm -hmm. that is going to keep you engaged and you're going to stay in that moment. Yeah, yeah. So, like, sensory play is a lot, can can help a lot. So you could use ice, you could use, like, hot wax and candles. You could, there's, like, these little pinwheels that you can roll on yourself or you could have a paddle, like, for spanking sessions and stuff like that, that it's all, like, bringing presence mm. into your body. Um, and then, again, things like being tied and especially that like submission and the dominance you're either having to lead the scenario or be led and therefore you're thinking you don't know what what's going to come if you're the submissive you don't know what's going to come next so you're anticipating it's like the balance of anticipation and reward and you it's exciting because you're you're think, you know you might have a blindfold on and they're walking around you you don't know if you're mm. or you have to be good else this will happen and it's just 
it's very mentally and body bodily stimulating and you can't necessarily have even time to think about what's for dinner tomorrow right <laughs> that first thing you that tantric so that was the first mm-hmm. one if someone wanted to sort of get started on that what, what would be the the beginner's course for getting into tantric so I, I attended like a three weekend um, practitioner course on kink and it was like tantric kink together. So it's very like conscious kink um, and we learned all about it there. So we did like shamanic journeys and it's very like breathing exercises, meditation and, and I, it's really difficult to explain but... Like when I've had sex and it's been tantric, it almost feels like I'm on a different planet. Like I'm, and I'm I come back, I'm like, whoa, what was that? <laughs> it's quite fun. And that's but, like, how how does one get in that sort of state of? Is that is tantric a state of mind? It's like I don't even know how to explain it. It's like meditation, spiritual, connective sex. It's like where you're breathing into yourself and you're very connected to the other person. It feels like vibrating almost. It's, it's, it's wild. I don't know enough, enough about it to be able to like fully teach mm. someone, but I've experienced it and it's been amazing. Um, but that's like the kind of, if someone wants to be conscious and loving during their sex, because not everyone wants to, you know, have, have BDSM types or kinky style sex. Mm. So that's kind of what I would suggest to look into if you want a kind of softer, more romantic experience. But you can use the things within BDSM softly. Like you, so lots of people think, oh, you're going to have loads of pain, but it doesn't, you don't have to have pain. You can just have sensation. You, the, the beauty of B, you, BDSM is you communicate a lot. So, What's, you know, sorry, what's BDSM? What is that? It stands for, uh, I'm going to forget now because I have ADHD. Like, but, <laughs> so be, uh, it, bondage, discipline, yeah. masochism, sadism. I've done those the wrong the wrong way round. Yeah, that, does, that sounds quite scary. It's like, is that, is that, is that is so sort of... bondage is being tied or restricted. So right, okay. Um, uh, discipline is obviously discipline. Um there's there's another two but i can't remember them off the top of my head but masochism and sadism is is giving and receiving so sadism is causing hurt to Mm. someone and masochism is liking receiving hurt so it's just a bracket of kink that people love and kink is like that's is that like an umbrella term for sort of everything you've spoken about so kink is essentially anything that is not classed as the norm. It's like right. outside of vanilla sex. So what that is, is kind of up, like individuals could decide mm. what kinky is, but essentially any, because some people think like, you know, a bit of hair pulling and, you know, a doggy doggy style is kinky, but then <laughs> I wouldn't call that kinky. So, but yeah, it's essentially just a little bit unusual. Um, whereas fetish is more intense it's like you you would need to have that element to be able to be sexually gratified or and it's quite often could it's like a fascination of fetishes like could Mm. be just leather could be just smelling leather and that would be like the most exciting thing ever in the world so so people get confused between kink and fetish but they're very different with this bdsm is there like a range of from quite subtle to quite extreme so mm-hmm. like a, yeah yeah so but, you know you you could just have some some cuffs um on the bed and like a tickle or a um a, a little a little paddle to play with and mm. some ice or you know i i like quite extreme so one of my things is like cnc which is consensual non-consensual and quite primal place so my husband will just say run and i've got to run hide away from him and then he'll catch me and so that's obviously a little bit more extreme yeah. um but then yeah it doesn't it's a range it's whatever floats yeah. your boat well it sounds like it's guaranteed to maintain your focus yeah exactly <laughs> this is why like primal play for me and my husband i i honestly would say that kink and 
and has, has probably saved my ADHD-ness because I, or saved me, because I would probably be addicted to something. And this, it really helps. My husband has ADHD as well. Mm. And it helps us channel our emotions. So if we're like really overwhelmed and angry, we'll have like really primal sex and like fight each other and like growl and it like gets all that emotion out or we might have like really emotional sex or we'll play the run game and you're like running away and so it's it's like a release um almost and and a time where i can have one stream of consciousness Mm. instead of 20 million you literally just hide somewhere in your house and then your partner like an kind of, adult version of hide and seek. Yeah, sometimes, um, quite often we'll do it like at a, if we're at a Air, new Airbnb or mm. a ho- like a hotel because we don't know what the layout is going to be. So we'll be like in the lift and he'll be like, you got one minute, run. <laughs> and then off I go. Is it, um, for stuff like that, is, is it sort of important to establish boundaries and, and I suppose a safe word? Things 100%, like that? yeah. So we have... Uh, the, the musts are you need to have a conversation before you do anything like this um, and find out someone's kind of yeses, nos, their maybes, um, th- things that might trigger them, mm. you know, experiences that might might trigger them. So I can't have jump scares. So even though I hide, he wouldn't jump scare me because that would, that would throw me. So have those kind of conversations. Then there's a safe word because... No doesn't always mean no when you're playing games like this. So um, people, we use the traffic light system. So we have red is stop completely and provide aftercare. Amber is, I don't like what's going on. Can we change it up a bit? But we don't need to stop the scene. And then green is good. So I've heard somebody use uh, meatloaf as there because they'll do anything for love, but (laughs) they won't do that. (laughs) That's a good one. Um, Or just use safe word because everybody knows what that is uh and then aftercare so don't just do it and go like have a cuddle have a chat give mm. them sometimes you reach subspace i don't know if you've heard of that what's, what's subspace it's almost like being like high like you you just aren't in your brain it's all you've had all this release of endorphins and your complete submission that you you go like a bit ditzy and and floaty and not quite there um so if that happens to someone, they're quite vulnerable. Mm. So then give them some snacks and some water and a blanket. And Are there any other examples that you can think of that would fall under sort of this BDSM? Uh, so many, so, so many. Any kind of like classical thing that you've seen to do with BDSM is, is so, you know, it could be a dominatrix with, you know, all the latex on or um i hate to say like the mr gray thing because he's a terrible example of bdsm but that is what most people identify as bdsm mm. he's just a terrible example because he abused that woman but because <laughs> <Yeah, yeah. laughs> there was no like safe word and mm. stuff like that she didn't have an out so that's a bad example but that's usually mm. what people think of I asked um, my, my community and one of the main thing that a lot of the, 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 the women said is they find that it's hard to reach orgasm mm-hmm. because of the reason, the first question, which was they struggle to maintain the focus. And mm-hmm. you think stuff like that actually helps you maintain the focus and therefore helps them reach orgasm. And are there any other tips that you can think of, particularly for people with ADHD to help them sort of get to climax? Yeah. So yeah, the physical stimulation and things like that, that's definitely something that's really helped me uh spontaneity a little bit has helped as well so like uh possibility of being caught like having like a time it's almost that time pressure like oh i'm gonna get caught or Mm. or some level of like publicness but obviously not exposing yourself to someone that doesn't want to (laughs) see um can be quite a fun thing to play with with adhd or the other thing is like working on those things that are hitting the break. So I, it used to be, my mind would be like, do I smell? Do I look good in this position? Is he enjoying himself? Or, so answering those questions that pop up that stop you being able to like have an orgasm, mm. have those conversations, because that might break that 
mind drift into those negative things right. that might stop those things happening. Um, and then also, um, it's you like using toys can help. So the other thing that I did that really, really helped is actually allowed my mind to drift, but to drift to like horny things. Mm. So before I'd be so worried about staying present that I would, my, when my mind drifted, it would be about random stuff. Whereas if I then allow my mind to drift to like the hottest sex I've ever had or like a something really horny that someone said that I really enjoyed, it was like, it was like it let, it, I was letting it drift, but it wasn't stopping the enjoyment of the situation because it wasn't drifting to negative things and I wasn't berating myself for it drifting. So having a conversation with my partner to say, this is kind of what helps me. So him not minding and also just carrying on stimulating me wherever I needed to be stimulated mm. and then letting my mind wander a bit um, helped. Mm. Um, that that was probably the biggest thing. And I would do things like uh, if I could orgasm on my own but not with a partner, um, which was part of my issue, I would do that but he would just kind of whisper stuff in my ear or kiss me while I was doing it myself and then those barriers of worrying about being able to orgasm with a partner would not affect me as much because I was used to orgasming with him then. Mm. You're kind of just not beating yourself up so much. Yeah. If your mind wanders, kind of let it wander and just enjoy where your mind takes you. Yeah, so I think that's a lot of the reason why it's okay a lot of the time when you're on your own is because your mind is wandering, but it's wandering to things that you want to and you're not berating yourself for mm. not being present and then you can still orgasm. Whereas if mm. you're like, oh, oh, I can't, like I keep feeling, then yeah. you can't do it. You just fill yourself up with shame, probably frustration as well because yeah, you're like, oh, yeah. why can I not? But actually if you just let your mind go. Yeah, but try and drift it to the yeah. horny stuff. <laughs> <laughs> do you think people with ADHD have a higher sex drive? So I was looking this up and it's actually, it's kind of like a, a big split. So it's, it looks like uh, the research kind of suggests that a lot of people with ADHD have a lower sex drive um, because of the issues of staying present, because of the problems having an orgasm or, you know, keeping, uh, staying hard and things like that. But then the other side are like almost like hypersexual um, because they use it as a stimulus, they use it for the dopamine hit. Mm. So I think it's like one end or the other. One or the other, yeah, no, it makes sense. And do you think, because of the, the, the side that's using it for the dopamine, do you think there's a chance that there's a, a risk of addiction towards the, sex? Yeah, there's lots of risks. There's risk of addiction to masturbation and sex, risk of addiction to porn, uh, risk of, you know not looking after your sexual health you might miss appointments to go to uh, have have testing you might forget condoms or lube you might um be going into risky situations where you're not really consciously thinking about is this sex that i want to have is this safe sex mm. um who am i having sex with like there's lots of elements to be kind of aware of that can be impacted by adhd yeah you, I mean, it makes total sense. I mean, as as a community, we of we we the obvious one. We know we sh we have memory issues. Some of us, um, so of course that kind of goes hand in hand with mm. the organisation of of carrying contraception, mm -hmm. going to that test. Do you think there's a higher risk of of uh, infidelity and cheating amongst the ADHD community? Yeah, I think so because. Um you know, anything that provides escape and dopamine is is a risk for somebody with ADHD. Mm. So if there's like something naughty and someone that's given you validation and attention and it feels good, then, you know, it's harder mm. to say no. And I, I've had conversations with friends in the past that have ADHD that have like maybe been talking to someone they shouldn't and then been like, am I doing this because I want to? Am I doing this because this is giving me a dopamine hit and it feels good? Mm. So it's a risk, but if you're aware and you're conscious of your ADHD, then you can be like, okay, this is what's happening now. And like for me, I'm polyamorous, so that was I, I don't have that. Um, just what does 
just in case anyone's listening, polyamorous, what does that mean? So I don't believe in kind of limitations on love, essentially. Mm. So me and my, like me and my, we're, I'm married and and he's my primary um, partner, but I can have other relationships with other people and sex with other people. Um, and that's okay. Mm. Yeah. I know it's fascinating, and 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 that's like a mutual, that's an agreement between the two of you. Yeah, yeah. So he's the same. So mm. we both have that kind of, and it and it just means that you know you still get to do all those exciting things mm. that you do when you're single, and you still get to connect with people. And you also, for us, it's like I don't think one person should have to provide for every need that you have. I think that's kind of a unrealistic standard mm. um so he might be he's fantastic he's the most loving person in the world but you know he's not very um work oriented so i might have someone else that supports me with that side of things like and i he loves hiking i can't stand hiking like i'm not climbing up a mountain <laughs> but he can have someone else that he mm. can enjoy those things with mm. and there's no jealousy in that situation there's definitely jealousy but i'm not afraid of jealousy like i i think um as humans we have this like we think that just because we have a bad feeling that means we shouldn't do something it's almost and i i would liken it to like oh should we not love because they might die and we experience grief like i'm it's okay if it's a healthy jealousy and not an unhealthy jealousy i don't think there's anything wrong with feeling an element of jealous mm. um and supporting someone like say he's feeling jealous because um i'm doing something with someone else um i can like one comfort him in that and two organize say it was like a date night organize a date night for him so he's still having those needs met even though I'm having time mm. with other people. It's just like having, like, I've got three children. I'm sure sometimes they get jealous of, of me, but it's mm. about managing time and nurturing each individual relationship. How long have you been with your husband for? It's Ten years, yeah. And you met and you were exclusive to each other, monogamous, mm -hmm. for how long? Uh, so nine, uh, yeah, nine years. So what conversation happened that made it clear and you both accepted that it was transitioning into a polyamorous relationship? So honestly, it was like, I, I've always been, uh, like, I've always respected who, our relationship and the boundaries that we held within that relationship as monogamy. But I always thought I was an asshole for having thoughts of wanting more connections with other people. And I don't know whether it was maybe where, like, I was raised in a split family. I had step parents, and I've got lots, like, I've got three children. So in my mind, I, I never saw love as this, like, finite thing. I thought, always thought it, it could be more than that. But then I couldn't, I didn't understand it until I kind of found um, some people on Instagram that, that educate on polyamory. And I was like, oh, okay that's me I'm not an asshole <laughs> and I kind of had this conversation with my husband that and I'd had like I'd been making content with other women but he didn't want me to make content with other men but I also had issue with that because I was like well what's the difference it's, surely that's kind of homophobic because what you're saying is that a woman is not a risk when I'm I'm bisexual like I I'd happy be with a woman so why is she less of a risk than a than a man so that was kind of in my head um and I just said like I th I feel like this is core to who I am and I don't feel like I can live any other way now knowing this happily so we can either kind of adapt and, and figure things out together or I feel like we can't be together anymore. So we had that conversation and we just kind of went baby steps, baby steps. Like at first it would be only at a sex party I could have sex with someone else or, you know, we had a threesome with someone else. Or it, And at every point of like opening more and more, we would have these conversations and it would be a decision made together. And slowly kind of... I would ex I would describe my husband as uh, ambient, like it's he could be happy, monogamous, or 
non-monogamous but as we opened he was like actually I get it like I get it I am enjoying this and I think it's benefited our relationship but I don't think you should do it as a fix like I think a lot of people are like oh we'll open because our relationship is on the rocks it wasn't like that for us we were very much in love and content and happy but it has benefited us because we both has to turn up for start because you've got other options. So you need to turn up for each other. You need to make effort with each other. You need to like make time for date nights and stuff because you're nourishing that relationship. And then also it it reduces the expectation on that person to fulfill every one of your needs. So it's been beautiful for us. Is there really jealousy between the two of you when you know that your husband or your wife is having sex with other people? Um, so I, yeah, in some ways, um, like I get jealous if like there's certain things, like if he tells me the specific words or, or that he said to another, like if he's like, oh, I cupped her face and I said this, I'm like, I don't want to know the details cause then I can see it and that bothers me, but it's just about communicating that or, um, the biggest thing to be aware of is it will get jealous if it's not necessarily because that person is experiencing something with someone else. It's because we're reflecting on not having that experience. So if you're if you're nourishing your own relationship, you're less likely to get jealous of the other person. But jealous, jealousy isn't necessarily an unhealthy thing. It's not a bad thing if it's if you understand it to be your emotion and something that you're allowed to feel but not expect the other person to change their behavior, then it's not necessarily a bad thing. But I also get a lot of comparison. So I'll feel if he's going on a date with someone, I'm excited because I want him to have all these beautiful experiences with people and connect with people. I'm like, oh, like, should we pick an outfit for you? And I'll drive him there because I'm like that. T- I'm very... Um, Empath- empathic mm. so I love to see people enjoy and that makes me feel good but he struggles with jealousy a bit a bit more than me but we just make sure we're nourishing that um our relationship you mentioned like you mentioned sex parties earlier so have you seen each other have sex with other people before um I have seen him but he hasn't seen me and how did you feel when you saw him have sex with someone I loved it because it's like seeing you don't get that angle when, like, you're having sex <laughs> with each other. Like, you know, you, you're close up on personal. I'm like, oh, look at him go. <laughs> That's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I loved it. And I'm like, it's almost like showing off. Like, yeah, you can yeah. you can borrow him. He's great. But he is married to me, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just on loan. <laughs> yeah, loan dick. <laughs> yeah. And did, did you, not to speak on his behalf, but did, did he enjoy having sex with someone else and knowing you were watching? Was that like a kink? Yeah, he he, he did. He was very excited because actually it was him. So he was, a, he was a virgin when I met him. So he'd only ever had sex with me. And then here I was like, here's this really hot girl. You can have sex with her and I'm going to watch. <laughs> He's like, oh, this isn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> And also, like, because I'm um, in the in uh, in the industry, like, I've I've glowed up. We've both like glowed up. We were, and and all of a sudden, he's like, "Cool, you're you're bringing me like a listers. These are these are really hot. <laughs> <laughs> Check this one out." <laughs> You've had threesomes together. Yeah, and that's with a, a, a woman being the third uh, person. So far, it's been with a woman, but they have he has plans. With a man, which I'm a bit scared about, but I'm sure it'll be fine. So the, the the third person's a man and the man has sex with you? So him and my husband. So my husband's planning it um, and it's with, he's got, they have a plan, but it's going to be a bit kinky, I think. So I don't <laughs> know what's going to happen to me. But <laughs> So is, is your boy, is your husband uh, going to have sex with the man? No, no, no. They're both having Sorry, sex with confused. me. There's lots of, They're both, lots of, lots I of mean, bits going <laughs> If they want to, they can crack on. But um, no, they're both going to have sex with me, but it's like a surprise. I don't know what's right, going to okay. happen and how they're organising it, but they've, mm. been, they've been voice noting each other very secretly, all these plans. So Are you excited? I am, but I'm also scared. Yeah. 
I don't know what they're going to do. And also, it's like a lot of expectation, isn't it? Like, as I think when there's an extra woman, there's lots of things you can do. But when it's just one woman, like, there's a lot of sausages and only so many holes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't know where they're all going to go. <laughs> Make sure I'm entertaining them all. There's three people in the bedroom. Is that enough excitement? Or do you still bring out tools and toys like the whips and stuff? I mean... Yeah, we still bring stuff out and especially like especially if things like that the scene that we're talking about like it's like ultimate submission and two men being dominant so mm. I could be tied up or have and I always use my doc, like my my doxy that's like the queen I, c- I can't really come mm. very well without that one so doxy is that for anyone who doesn't know what's that uh, it's a big the microphone big wand vibrator Right okay my favorite one so She's always there. I've got two, one downstairs and one's upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> Do you think there's a higher concentration of neurodiversity and ADHD within like the polyamorous community? Uh, from what I've experienced and seen, there seem to be. And again, I think it's like that. I feel like ADHD people, they're not afraid to talk about difficult topics. Mm. In fact, they'd much rather talk about the difficult topics than the... The small talk, like small talk is awkward. I, I want to know what's in your route. Yeah. <laughs> what gets you going? Um, and so they tend to talk about things more and be and explore more and, and, and be more accepting of those things. Mm. Um, and, and I think they challenge kind of systems and authority a little bit. Like, hang on a minute. Why do I need to do it this way? It, just because I'm told to. Maybe actually it's okay to do it a different way too. Yeah, definitely. They're sort of that um, not wanting to do what you're told element, I guess, in a way. Mm. And that's sort of, you know, you're told, well, that's what you're meant to do. You're meant to be monogamous. So you might rebel against that idea of society, that norm, mm-hmm. and, and go against it. And you mentioned last Christmas you you sort of uh, approached someone and they turned you down? No, that it wasn't that. So basically, obviously, I'd been very comfortable in my nine years of monogamy with somebody who absolutely worships the bones of me um and so the first time we kind of opened and I started connecting with other people especially because these people were in the industry and used to non-monogamy and stuff they were like really really good at sex I was really attracted to them I was having a great time and I wasn't used to compartmentalizing them and I would get I was getting like quite attached and I'm, I'm very affectionate um, and so I think sometimes that's a bit overwhelming for some people. And so I had someone kind of say like, this is too much almost. And maybe we should keep our relationship like as, as a friendship. Mm. Um, and that, that really, really upset me, even though they weren't even necessarily rejecting me. They were just saying, you know, they didn't want that side of things anymore. But it really hurt me. But I don't know. I can't. I guess it is just the rejection thing. Because mm. logically, it was fine. But at my core, I, f- I really was sad for a long, like a good week. Did you speak to your partner, your husband, about it? Yeah, I did, and he was amazing. But also, I think that did add a, a level of challenge because I felt like guilty to expect him to comfort and care for my rejection of somebody else and I felt I was worried that he would be like but I'm here like why are you sad about him when he's not even like your rela- you didn't even really have a relationship with him it was just someone that you enjoyed having sex with a few mm. times like why you, I, I was anxious that he would be frustrated or annoyed that he would have to comfort me because of someone else so it, it does add a level of mm. comfort but we've had conversations since where I've expressed that I was worried about that and he was like no because that's you would do that with a friend you because I've had rejection from friends and I've been the same like stewing over why and but um and he's like it's no it's no real difference in fact you predicting me and then pulling away because you're expecting me to feel like that and then me not able to give you comfort is worse than Mm. me just providing you with the comfort you think that communication is 
the, the most important thing if someone's thinking about going into the polyamorous world, having that open dialogue between your partner to say, this is the situation, have that agreement, but is communication the most important thing in that world? Yeah, fearless communication and understanding like how to how to communicate and, and why you are the way you are. So me and my husband, one of the biggest things that have supported us is like understanding things like understanding our attachment styles. So he has quite an anxious attachment. I have quite a, a um, mixed attachment. So here it's like that push and pull, understanding why they're behaving in the ways they do and, and how you communicate. Like just instead of being angry or being like, you did this, be like, like appreciate all the things they do do first and say, this is how I'm feeling. This might be why I'm feeling like this. How can we move forward from this? Um, so I think learning how to communicate is a massive thing. Is there any other advice you might give to someone if they're exploring the possibility of entering the polyamory community? Um, I think about just assessing your reasons for it. So obviously there's different levels of ethical non-monogamy. There's polyamory, which is what I identify as as I can have relationships and stuff with other people. And then there's things like swinging. And so it's, why do you want it? Uh, is it because you're trying to like fix a relationship? In which case maybe, well, it's not the best thing to do. Or is it because it's kind of core to who you are? And um, I think accepting that it's going to, it's not an easy ride. Like it's definitely, I've definitely felt vulnerable and I'm someone who has a lot of kind of self understanding of all these things and I've struggled. So I think you have to really want it and, and be willing to kind of do the work, especially if you're in, I think if you're solo, like if you're on your own and then you're going into polyamory and you're open to it, then I think that's a bit different. If you're monogamous going into polyamory, I think it's a challenge. Do you think there's like a, a risk of of emotional tr like damage in that world where you might think that you are you're, you're you're able to manage it, but actually you might become more attached than you thought you would, and actually the, the thought of them then being with someone else is is too much too much for you to handle. Mm, I think it has happened. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? Because I think we get a lot of anti kind of ethical non-monogamy and people saying if if people can't work it out then then people are very quick to blame the relationship style mm. but then 60 percent of monogamous relationships experience a level of infidelity um and might therefore break up and nobody ever blames the relationship style so i don't think you're any more at risk of uh but it might just be that you're more kind of aware of it mm. rather than because there's it's there's not a lot of support and there's not a lot of kind of guidance on how to do it whereas monogamy is set rules you know what you should and shouldn't do you know and then in polyamory it's like there's these boundaries that might be crossed and you don't understand so like you you might have a rule and it's miscommunicated and therefore someone does something that they shouldn't because they've misunderstood what the boundary was. So there's this kind of messiness, essentially. Mm. Yeah. It's fascinating. And I'm sure a lot of people will be interested and uh, will have learned a lot, actually, um, from just listening to you there. Do you think like rejection-sensitive dysphoria, do you think that comes into the mix with people with ADHD and sex in in the context of one partner making a move and the other essentially saying no or after the act the no cuddling or the guy or the girl whatever just kind of jumps up and carries on with their day and there's a sense of like abandonment there do you think rsd comes into the comes into this conversation yeah 100 percent. that's something i struggle with really badly and i've actually like closed down a lot of my ex relate exploration because I had like a, re a level of rejection from someone like around Christmas and it it like broke me I was so upset so I'm like oh I just need to heal from that and it it I felt like frustrated at myself I was like why am I so sad 
but I literally was like like a sad in my heart. Mm. So it's definitely something that, to be aware of and to to like allow yourself to feel and to comfort if you get that because we're sensitive beings. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think I guess communication between the partners, whether one of you one of you have, has ADHD or both of you, like to have that awareness and to know that you know afterwards, don't just get up and walk off because mm -hmm. I'm going to react to that probably a lot worse than 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 your average person, perhaps. Yeah, and it, and it's about communicating needs, isn't it? Like, I think lots of people experience rejection in lots of different ways. Um, so for me, I. I'm always quite clear with people at the beginning. I'm like, oh, I, I need um, clear communication of, like, if you're going to be quiet with me for a week, that's fine. Can you mm. just tell me? Just be like, oh, I'm, I won't be able to talk to you until this day, and then I'm fine. But if you don't tell me, then I'm going to be like, what have I done? What have I done? Mm. Why is it? So it's, I think it's about knowing what you need and, and communicating that need with the person. And if they're not willing to meet that, then then probably not the right person anyway. Yeah, absolutely. RSD, rejection sensitivity dysphoria, um, if it's not understood and spoken about within a relationship, it just seems to be the reason so many ADHD relationships break apart ultimately mm -hmm. in the end. And to have that awareness, especially with something so personal and intimate as sex, you know, to have that understanding of if I'm vulnerable enough and to, you know, to initiate something with you and you're just not in the mood, rather than just saying no, you know, have, let's have a conversation and say why that's... Because otherwise it, it could have a really big flare-up mm -hmm. that could lead into a big row and that could lead into whatever, a breakup. Actually, a conversation from awareness of RSD probably could have just slowed that process down, do you think? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think just be just being clear and open mm. and honest... You've brought uh, so, some some toys with you today, Alex. Al Alice, I'm fascinated to, <laughs> to, to get not to... so much toys because I thought toys might get us in trouble. Oh wow! And I, oh gosh, yeah, okay. And th these are all things to keep people focused and yeah. keep people engaged. Yeah, but it's but it's not just so with this one. It's not just about like cracking a whip on someone and hurting them. Like obviously, the physical stimulation of the of the impact mm. is is a mental stimulation, but just like walking around someone when you're the submissive and you're sat you're not thinking about because you're like when are they gonna hit me or how are they gonna hit me or what do I need to do to stop them from doing that so your mind is very busy with with the the kind of threat of it so mm. that's fun riding crop because it's like very feminine I like it you can yeah okay like, <laughs> okay uh, so these are all essentially designed to to bring some fun, excitement. Yeah, uh, and even just like the stim stimulation, the the symbolism of them and stuff yeah. can be like, oh, someone dominant is in the room, or you can have that power, and you can almost embody like an alter ego sometimes mm. when you're being dominant. Um, and then I got stockings because I wanted to show that you don't actually have to really have like special equipment so you can use this as a blindfold or you can have them as like ties with mm. your hands or your feet um and yeah you can get creative you can use things kind of around the house rather than needing to buy like any special binds or anything like that. i did bring a candle a body safe candle but apparently i have adhd <laughs> and i've lost it <laughs> <laughs> body safe candle so how what what does that do it just is a candle that um runs at a lower temperature so it it can't like burn you but you get the the wax it's very pretty if you mm. get different colors um and you can pour it all over yourself and have the heat it's very energizing as well i think because it's like the fire mm. element um and that can be quite fun and it's fun to play games like I did. I had like a scene with 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 a dom recently where he had like a paddle. One side was like had like little spikes on, and one side was flat. Mm. And he would like spank my bum, and I would have to guess which side he was using. And if I got it wrong, he would start start again, and I had to get all the way to ten. <laughs> so I had to concentrate so hard mm. to think about what side. It was, 
I couldn't think about anything else. And then if I got it wrong, I'd be so cross <laughs> because I had to start again. But it's fun. And mm. of course you can't think about... Uh, what you, you want know, for dinner. Or... What you want for dinner or, you know, if you remember to uh, take the post <laughs> to the post office because you're going to get your bum spanked really yeah, yeah. hard if you get it wrong. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, all of these things are bringing in new stimuli into the mind of the person that might otherwise, without them, get bored. Mm -hmm. Or their mind might wonder and they'll, they'll leave the moment. And because of that, they might, yeah, they might upset their partner because their partner will rec recognize that they're kind of not in into it. Mm -hmm. And also, they won't have a great time because because they've zoned out, they probably won't be able to reach climax. Yeah, so exactly. All of these things are essentially almost like hacks to snap the snap the attention or keep it in in the moment, like whether yeah. that's through pain or heat or being chased around the house. <laughs> you know, all, yeah, is that kind of the idea to sort yeah. of like add in extra bits of stimulus to to keep you in the moment? Yeah, uh, yeah, essentially, and then also that element of uh, like the game element and having a, a dominant or or being submissive where someone else is taking control. Mm. Um, so your stream of consciousness is their stream of consciousness or you are in control. So you have a responsibility for someone else. So again, you're thinking about them because a lot of people I think think that it's just the submissive side that has that, like that channel of, of consciousness. But my husband says very much the same for the dominant because you're thinking about the submissive and what you need to do for them. So yeah, just streamlining your mm. your brain a little bit. And but most people with ADHD are submissive, uh, research suggests. And quite often they're like bratty. So it's like that resistance to authority. It's just they'll you'll be told what to do, but then you say no and you're naughty and mm. you get punished. But also, I think that's sometimes really nice because for me, I know I'm a brat. I just fight you. And I'm like, no, I won't do what I'm told. But then as an ADHD person, often that's what you had as a child, you know, that resistance and not being understood and not doing as you were told. But when you're doing it within kink, you get lovingly held, you know, you get... You get, you might get punished, but it's punishments that you want, and mm. then you're 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 being loved in that naughtiness. And I think for somebody with ADHD, that can be really healing because you were just kind of told that you were bad, and now you're almost being rewarded for that naughtiness. Mm. It's quite a healing thing. And brat, is that a? Is there like a male equivalent of? of no, you'd still be a brat. Ma male yeah. can be a brat as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what, yeah. what would you call someone who's on sort of on the other end? So, oh, so like dominant. The dominant one. Dom. So, so you get like, you. There, there's like, might be master or mistress or, um, you know, but yeah, essentially mm. they're the dom. Um, right. You're the sub. But it's a t there's like different types. So you could be a service sub mm. where you... Do, do as you're told because you loved or you want to make them a cup of tea or clean the house for you or, or you could be like a you can be like a pleasure dom where you give dominance through like might be like over and over orgasms over and over mm. and over and over so it's like forced orgasms or pleasure using pleasure to dominate someone so there's lots of different types and all of these sort of toys the, the whip and the other stuff that can all be incorporated into this sort of role play yeah 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 what about when you're like out and about? I know you're not going to sort of get naked or anything, but is there, is there a way if someone's, if you're like a couple and you're in the supermarket or wherever, somewhere public, is there anything like you can have fun that isn't obviously illegal and get you into trouble, but you know between you two, it's kind of like a, a hint or sort of setting yeah, you up there when is, you get home. So like there's different things. So I have a, this is a collar. This is a day collar. Mm. I can't take this off. So my dom has the key. My husband has a key. So that's kind of like a symbol okay. of submission in public. But you can you can do lots of things like uh, you can have like the this like things that go inside that the partner can turn on and off. A oh, remote um, control. Remote control. Yeah, but obviously, please only use those in adult <laughs> spaces. <laughs> um, so there's things like that. So you can't, or you could have like a plug or something, or. Um, 
you, you there's there's loads of different little games that mm. you can you can do um that that are fun um yeah anything else do you think alice that that it's worth talking about if someone's listening with ADHD and they they struggle to focus, struggle to pay attention, struggle to reach orgasm because of that. Is there anything else? Any any other sort of tips that they they might need to hear? I think that I just want them to know that it's 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 not like it, it's not their fault. Like I, even when I did the reel about about you know oh I was having sex and then I was thinking about that it was my granddad's birthday and blah, blah, blah. It was like, oh, my God. Like, I think even some people might think about, like, oh, you know, I need to take my kid to school tomorrow. And they're like, oh, my God. Like, and it's it's not not your fault. Mm. Like, I want people to know that it's okay. You're not alone in feeling like this. And there are things that you can do to feel better. And the first step is to talk about it. Um, so that's kind of what I want them to know. Mm. We, we spoke before on the phone before we met today and you, you said something that was quite interesting and worth mentioning. You said that there's, you think there's a higher percentage of neurodiversity, ADHD within the sex work industry. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So like I haven't met one person within the industry that hasn't got a level of neurodivergency, like either ADHD or autism or something. And I, mm. I just think it's because we're quite hypersexual and we're also quite business minded and we like dopamine and we like numbers. So that's, you get all of that from, mm. from this. And, and I also have this like ability then to switch my hyper focus. So one, one week it might be, you know, editing videos. And then the next week it might be how to do my makeup really well. And then the next week it might be, you know, filming, uh the next week it might be networking the next week it might be sales and i can dot around and not get bored um mm. well people with adhd have uh we're 400 percent more likely to be an entrepreneur so there's that also there's that crossover there mm-hmm. of like entrepreneurial qualities um and obviously you tie that up with with um with with sex, you can kind of see how, how that can yeah come and creativity yes. and because yeah. you know you, you're thinking about you know what outfits you can wear and mm. you're editing the pictures and you're 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 making like designs for posters for things and it's like you know it's ADHD heaven I don't know why I would do anything <laughs> else <laughs> how long so how long have you been a professional uh in in the space for a professional um how would you describe your your only fans content so I'm a sex educator uh, qualified sex educator but I wasn't when I started um, so my content has kind of evolved over time so originally it was like almost an outlet for me because uh, you know I I was been with my husband for for eight years and I wanted you know, like I've, I've been with him since I was 19 so I didn't really have that kind of experience of sexual exploration um, and I just wanted an outlet. So I was like, I want to, I want to do this. I could make some money. And then, then that went on to realizing that, that a lot of people were coming on OnlyFans because they had questions and they, they wanted answers. And then, yeah, obviously becoming a sex educator. But so I've, I've been doing it now for three years. Um, started, I guess that was 2021 20, and I was pregnant mm. at the time. So. Is it quite a lucrative business? It depends. I think there's this false, like, cons- this misconception that you, you take your top off and then you're going to get loads of money thrown at you. But if you do it and you do it well, like I do, <laughs> <laughs> then, <laughs> then uh, you can be. Um, so I, I make about 60 grand a month. 60 grand a month? Yeah, yeah. That's quite a lot. That is quite a lot, isn't it? That's how, was that like, it didn't start that much, right? No, it have... like it started, it, it not, I was quite excited about getting 400 quid. Um, <laughs> and then it's it was very up and down as my marketing and my niche and my experience changed and how much time I had. But it only really went wild this year. So I think in, in like June, um, I earned like two grand and then it just went. What do you think separates you someone who's making 60 grand a month from from somebody who might join and struggles to make money on there um 
so the biggest thing, and I always, because I'm so blunt, I guess, because the neurodivergence, and sometimes I try and like, because I'm a qualified social media marketing person mm. as well. I've got um, a level five in that. So sometimes I help people with their social medias and they come to me and I'll be like, well, where's the value for the person watching this video on, you know, someone jiggling around and then in an outfit, like where's, what are you giving to the person watching? So the, the thing that I think uh, gets the people to the very top is they're very, very niched on, on what they provide for their audience. So, you know, for me, it's sex education, uh, you know, that I, Rebecca Goodwin it's 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 like comedy she's hilarious so she or there's like I know Mama Plugs she she's does like cars and so there's it's they prov they're providing something mm. uh, they're thinking of their audience first rather than copying everyone else and just being like a body that anybody can do and if someone's listening who thinks that they want to give it a go do you think it's it's too saturated now or do you think there's still niches that haven't been tapped into um i think if you're if you're good at marketing then you can you can do it but it's like you know it's like anything if you are doing it for a quick buck for the wrong reasons you're not business minded you're not willing to put in the work and understand that you're probably not going to make money for a mm. little while then it's not going to be any good for you i do think in a way it's kind of dropped off a little bit where I think it was really exciting to people at first like oh there's a girl on the internet and I can see what a vagina looks like or a vulva looks like mm. let's go see it but that's kind of old news now isn't it it's like oh they don't want to see another vagina but got to sort of go above and beyond and give something yeah something give something new. yeah 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 do you think um I mean does it really depend on I suppose I don't know how to say this but how far you're willing to go um on OnlyFans in terms of how or if you've got a niche does it you don't need to perhaps be too explicit if your niche is if we're in giving value in another way yeah i think it, again it depends on what what you need to stand out so you could stand out by doing some really crazy weird stuff mm. or you could stand out because you make your customer feel heard and seen or give them something that nobody else does so just finally i ask all my guests to tell me an item that most represents adhd in their life and you told me your item was an amazon parcel an yes. amazon package <laughs> um i yeah if you just don't show the address don't show the camera. address yeah because <laughs> that's from downstairs <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so uh, yeah your item is a amazon parcel yeah and i'm not plugging amazon but you know <laughs> when it's five o'clock in the morning and i'm doing some shopping they deliver the next day um <laughs> <laughs> so i picked this one because I it's always really funny in my house when when all the deliveries arrive because I can never remember what I ordered so it's like a little Christmas present I'm like oh what is it and then I open it I'm like oh yeah, yeah. I remember <laughs> <laughs> really relatable yeah. yeah you order something don't you and then you kind of forget it and then you, yeah, it's always a yeah. surprise I'm like oh I get really excited I'm like oh yeah I forgot I ordered this <laughs> or like I'm like oh it's only tape <laughs> <laughs> you ever had something that's turned up and you just it's it's just like a, a huge shock? What's the most like shocking thing you've ever ordered that you've forgotten about? I'm sure there is, but I can't I can't remember off of the top of my head. But there has been some. There was something really really funny that happened last week that was ADHD mm. though. Um, I just moved house and we got had delivery people come and take all the stuff. And because I didn't want them to see my five hundred pound machine, sorry, a sex machine, yeah, <laughs> I hid it. No, I'm interested to know what that is. It's a it's a big it's a big machine that has a thing, a rod on the end that goes like this, yeah. Oh, I, okay. So yeah. it has. So I hid it in the wardrobe, because, and then. I forgot that I hid it in the wardrobe and I had a phone call for my landlord, my old landlord, to say, um, so you've you've left something here. Uh, it's, it's a machine of some sorts and it has... <laughs> I couldn't even argue it because it had F, F star CK on the side of it. <laughs> He's like, oh, now I've got to go and pick it up because... 
I'm not losing that. It's 500 quid and it makes great content like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. He's really, he's really an old man as well. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, ADHD. Yeah. He uh, he knew what it was. He must have done. I don't. Well, I'm sure. I think it was. Aren't, sh- aren't all old men a bit kinky? Yeah, yeah. they love it. Maybe I'm. Um, hope he doesn't <laughs> use it. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> I hope you cleaned it before you used it. Yeah. What's the most impulsive thing you've ever done? Uh oh my god, so much. Probably had my weight loss surgery. I think I booked that and went and had it like a week later. Um. I do crazy stuff um, because I've got bipolar as well. So, you know, <laughs> mix a bit of mania in there and I'm off to Scotland and deciding I'm going to be a full service sex worker. I didn't do it in the end. Nothing wrong with full service, but it definitely wasn't what I wanted. Full service? What's that? You know, escorting. Oh, I see. Yeah, I just ran away to Scotland mm. and uh, signed up. And then my husband was like, look, I don't think you're very well at the moment. <laughs> Maybe you should come back home. <laughs> well, it's nice that you have a husband who can who can recognise that. And, and, and yeah, he's that. a good egg. He's yeah. very good. Alice, thank you so much. It's been fascinating. Thank you for having me. It's been really fun. And yeah, if you want to come and find me and learn all about your sexual selves as somebody with ADHD, I'm sure you can have a lot of fun. I'll put all your links in the description. I appreciate that. Thanks, Alice. <laughs>